and welcome to all of our watchers and listeners. It's a great joy this evening to welcome you all for this first installment of a lecture series here at St. Teresa of Calcutta Parish, a lecture series which will feature the one and only Father Ed Moran. He'll be talking to us uh, over the next few Wednesdays, each Wednesday night from 7 p.m. to 7.30 p.m. He'll be talking to us about this great topic of the last week in the life of Christ. And Father Ed has a book that he's going to share with us that will tell us a little bit about this last week in the life of Christ. So, Thank you, Deacon Joseph, and welcome. Glad to see you all. The series, but it, uh, someone gave me this book quite a while ago called The Last Week of Jesus. The Last Week, what the Gospels really teach about Jesus' final day in Jerusalem. Mm. It's by a Marcus J. Borg and a John Dominic Crossan. And I was intrigued by this title, and I find this book to be very interesting because it kind of lets us into the scenes, behind the scenes, concerning the last days of Jesus' life. So I'd like to begin by <clears throat> reading to you something from the introduction of this book, and it tells you a little bit about what their ideas and what they're trying to do here. We do not, in this book, intend to attempt a historical reconstruction of Jesus last week on earth. So it's not necessarily a reconstruction of the last days. Our purpose is not to distinguish between what actually happened from the way it is recorded in the four gospels. So they're not attempting to make a diff uh, to contradict what's in the gospels, mm -hmm. but rather to get into the gospels and see what really is going on here. We intend a much simpler task to tell and explain against the background of a Jewish high priestly collaboration with the Roman imperial control. And I think that's what's going to be uh, surprising for all of us to see that. And so they sum it up by saying, uh, basically, <clears throat> what we work together here on a humbler task to tell the story everyone thinks they know too well and most do not seem to know at all. Mm. So what's kind of interesting here is that they're not retelling the story, they're not attempting a historical reconstruction, but they're digging into what the Gospels are saying in the time and culture of, of the day. Mm. So I think that's where we're going to go with that. Okay. Right? So they're kind of providing another lens or perspective onto certain events in yes, the last week of Christ's exactly, life. Exactly, right. Okay. And the two things, even if we have enough time this evening, the two things I want us to look at mm -hmm. is the procession, Palm Sunday. I'm sorry, the book retells Palm Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Holy Thursday, Good Friday, and Holy Saturday. Okay. In this series, we will be looking at basically Palm Sunday, Holy Thursday, and Good Friday. And what I've done is I've taken sections of this book and I'm going to review them with you, and hopefully you will feel free to ask questions. Again, this is from the perspective of two scripture scholars, Marcus J. Borg and John Dominic Crossan. Mm. All right. So I'll begin with um, Palm Sunday. Great. All right. And I found this fascinating. I believe I mentioned this to you earlier before that on this spring day in the year 30, there, it was Passover week, as we all know from the story. Mm. And I'm going to ask you, if you don't mind, would you like to read the actual sure. gospel account? Yeah. And here it is right here. This is to be found in Mark chapter 11, verses 1 through 11. Mark chapter 11, verses 1 through 11. So it's springtime in the year 30, and this is the description of Jesus' entry into Jerusalem. When they were approaching Jerusalem at Bethphage and Bethany near the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples and said to them, Go into the village ahead of you, and immediately as you enter it, you will find tied there a colt that has never been ridden. Untie it and bring it. If anyone says to you, Why are you doing this? Just say this, The Lord needs it, and will send it back here immediately. They went away and found a colt tied near the door outside in the street. As they were untying it, some of the bystanders said to them, What are you doing, untying the colt? They told them what Jesus had said, and they allowed them to take it. Then they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their cloaks on it, and he sat on it. Many people spread their cloaks on the road, and others spread leafy branches that they had cut in the fields. Then those who went ahead and those who followed were shouting, Hosanna! Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord! Blessed is the coming kingdom of our ancestor David. 
Hosanna in the highest heaven. Then he entered Jerusalem and went into the temple. And when he had looked around at everything, as it was already late, he went out to Bethany with the twelve. Great. <clears throat> so what did you find? Did you find anything rather bizarre or strange about this reading, this incident? I guess it's already, it seems like, providing this perspective on this event that kind of, I mean, obviously it's a reading from the gospel, but the mm -hmm. way in which it's presented, you know, getting into the sort of the mindset and the perspective of the people lying their branches down and the people who are all the crowds that are coming before right. for this procession. Exactly right. Mm -hmm. um, yes, you're exactly right. And what Cross and, and Marcus Borg do is they, they give some surprising insights mm. on this particular event, all right? So it is, as I said to you, the year, approximately the year 30. It's springtime. It's the beginning of Passover. Mm. And what these two scholars are saying and through their studies is, I think I told you there were two processions coming into mm -hmm. Jerusalem that day, one led by Jesus Christ and the other by Pontius Pilate. Mm. And now as I go through this, I would imagine you'll have some questions mm. as I go through this, the implications of all of this, mm. okay? So Jesus is coming into Jerusalem from the east and Pilate is coming in from the west. Okay, so they're coming in two different gates to the city. Um, Jesus is riding on a colt, a young donkey, and he's coming from the Mount of Olives, and people are cheering him as he enters into the city. We know that much from the story. Dominic Crossan calls this the peasant procession. Mm. And uh, the other one coming in is coming in from the west, Led, lead, led by Pontius Pilate, and it's the imperial procession. Mm. And right away you can see that there's going to be a clash between the two. Mm -hmm. Now, as you probably know, Passover time in Jerusalem is a very busy time, mm. and usually a lot of uprisings are taking place at this time. These two scholars are saying that Jesus prearranged his entry into the city. It wasn't happenstance. He knew very well what was going on, and he prearranged this to, as, as I'm going to explain this to you. Mm -hmm. Jesus is coming from the peasant village of Nazareth, and his followers are coming with him as well. His message is going to be the kingdom of God. It's about 100 miles from Galilee to Jerusalem, and Jesus begins journeying. Jesus' whole notion of journeying to Jerusalem is a major theme in Mark's gospel, a major theme. So. The imperial procession, I'll begin with that, with that being led by Pilate, mm -hmm. okay? Um, they're coming in from the west, Pilate, we have heard the name, he's the governor of three sections of Israel, Idumea, Judea, and Samaria. And he's at the head of a column of imperial cavalry and soldiers. Mind you, Jesus is at the head of a procession with peasants. peasants. Mm. Two different classes of people. Mm. Um, Jesus is going to be proclaiming the kingdom of God, whereas Pilate is proclaiming the kingdom of Rome. Mm. Um, the two processions embody the central conflict that's going to take place in the last week of Jesus' life, the kingdom of God and the kingdom of Rome. Now, um, the Jerusalem procession that Pilate was in charge of there uh, and these scholars are calling it, as I said to you, the imperial processions. Uh, it was a standard practice, I found out, that all the major feast days, specifically, if you will, Passover, it was a practice for the Roman governors to make a show of their entry into the city. Remember, this is a, politic this is a, a religious festival, and Pilate is not coming into Jerusalem for reasons of religion, mm. but for reasons of politics. Uh, he, had, he was living in a town called Caesarea Maritima, about 60 miles west of Jerusalem. He lived in luxury, and he did not like going into Jerusalem, which was just the opposite of where he was living. Uh, he was able to, he's going in there, as I mentioned to you, to quell, to stop any kind of uprising against the Roman government. Because Passover is, if you look at it, Passover 
is the celebration of the liberation of the Jewish people from an imperial power, mm. that being Egypt. Mm. Given the fact that at this time in the year 30, there are many insurrections taking place in this part of the Roman Empire, and that Jerusalem was a very sore spot for the Roman government. And given the fact that there were many revolutionaries wandering in the city at this time, you can see why the Roman government would make a show of their coming into the city, mm. you know? And I want you to kind of imagine this. You and I have seen movies of, of Roman soldiers, but try to put yourself there, and see what they saw. Cavalry on horses, foot soldiers, leather and armor and weapons and banners, golden ingle on, on poles as they were coming into this town, the marching of feet, the cracking of leather, the beating of drums, and swirling dust. Mm. It was quite a sight meant to impress or intimidate the, the citizens of that town, mm. Jerusalem. Now, that's the imperial reason or the political reason but there's also a very, I think you may find this very interesting, there's also what's something called imperial theology. So on the one hand, we have imperial politics, and on the other hand, imperial theology. And it goes something like this. The emperor is not only the ruler of the Roman Empire, he is also a god. Mm. And this was started by Augustus Caesar. And it was common practice to refer to the emperor as son of God and savior and Lord. Sounds familiar. Yes, I'm telling you, this is, this is, not, this is all for a specific reason. Mm. And after death, it was believed that Augustus ascended to heaven. So in imperial theology, well before Christ's birth, you have the emperor being called son of God, Lord and savior, and believed to ascend into heaven. Mm -hmm. Now for pious Jews, Pilate's procession embodied not only a rival order, but a rival theology. What do you think of that? Mm -hmm. That really does set the stage for those two processions then. You have, you know, not only it the does. political ramifications, but also, as you're saying, much higher stakes of theological ramifications of these two exactly. almost battling processions in a certain sense. That is exactly right. Mm. And remember, this is all, Jesus knows exactly what he's doing, mm. okay? What do you think, before I get into this, mm. since I've set the scene for you between these two political rivals and no, noticing that Jesus planned this beforehand, what do you think is gonna happen? Mm. It seems like what's would be set up to happen as sort of a clash of the, these two, almost in a sense, two classes in a certain sense. Exactly. But we know, of course, from the Gospels that the people come and so, you know, joyfully welcome Jesus. So Pontius Pilate and the political authorities could not have reacted well to seeing that happen, knowing exactly. that, that would happen. Exactly right, Joe. That's, that's exactly what's going to happen. Mm. Now let's take a look at Jesus's entry into the city. It's going to be the complete opposite of Pilate. Um, now, the notion of uh, uh, the donkey, I'm going to explain to that in a mm. few moments, but we think we are pretty familiar with this story. You know, Jesus, the crowds laying down their cloaks and the palm branches and welcoming him, welcoming him into Jerusalem and saying, Hosanna to the Son of God. There are a lot of implications here for what these things mean. I, I said to you that Jesus is coming from the east, all right? And this colt, this donkey, had to have been one that had never been ridden on, all right? And, you know, we don't pay much attention to these things, like the word colt, um, but Cross and, and Borg make quite a bit out of that particular thing. Again, thinking, keeping in mind that Jesus knew exactly what he was doing. Mm -hmm. um, so, He's coming into the city from the Mount of Olives, and so there's an enthusiastic follower sympathizing with him, and they're shouting this particular uh, affirmation that I've always found very interesting. Hosanna, uh, remember, the words associated with Caesar, okay? Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, Jesus, or Pilate. 
Blessed is the coming of the, our ancestors' kingdom, David's kingdom. Hosanna in the highest heaven. There are definite political overtones to everything that's going on here. Um, first of all, the idea of, it's almost like, if you will, a political demonstration that's yeah. about to take place. Now this entry of Jesus is rich in Old Testament symbol, symbolism. And for that, you simply go to the book of Zechariah, which speaks of the following. A king riding on a donkey will banish war from the land. No more chariots or war horses or bows. He will be a king of peace. Do you see what's going on here? Mm. Now, I'm not sure how much of that the people themselves understood, but certainly Jesus did. So you have one coming in representing a kingdom of violence and terror and, and uh, suppression. And Christ is coming in on the other end of the city, bringing about the kingdom of God, which would be a kingdom of peace and no more war or domination. Mm. That's the key word, mm -hmm. okay? Um, Pilate embodied power and glory and oppression. Jesus embodied the kingdom of God. These contradictions will mark gospel, Mark's gospel, and it will be played out in the life of the early Christians. Early Christians had to really struggle with this. The kingdom of God versus the kingdom of Rome, and how do we live in both? Any questions so far? I think uh, we're really setting this up to be quite a showdown when these two yeah. sides come right, to it. Right. But I think another thing that's interesting to me that you were just mentioning is maybe some of these crowds, as they're coming to greet Jesus, maybe some of them are thinking that he is going to be sort of this great sort of intimidating figure that their political figure they're looking for and come to find out as he knows and as he's trying to show them that he's wanting to be this king after Zechariah's model, king of peace and that is exactly a wholly right. different model. And obviously, as they'll see later in his you know, and what happens to him, you know, he, mm -hmm. he becomes the king, but not in the, maybe in the way that they were looking for, you know, maybe they're looking for some kind of great political figure who would take down Pontius Pilate, mm -hmm. but instead he ends up becoming, you know, That's exactly right. executed by Pontius that Pilate. That is exactly yeah. right. Yeah. Hosanna to the son of God. Mm. Hosanna to the one who will bring about the kingdom of David. Yeah. So, you know, in the mind of Christ, this is not about politics. This is about establishing the kingdom of God in this world, a kingdom of peace and acceptance. But in the crowd themselves, in singing that, that psalm, Hosanna to the Son of David, there are many political overtones yeah. that are taking place there. And maybe even among the disciples and the apostles, too, oh, yes. as they're coming with him, they're thinking, oh, he's going to set himself up as some great political figure, and maybe we'll get some of the, the spoils from that, you know? There are a lot of implications to this, you know, mm -hmm. uh, you know, the mind of Jesus, the mind of his followers, and the mind of his disciples, you know? Now, Crossan and uh, Bohr go into a great deal of detail describing Jesus in Mark's Gospel in Jerusalem. How much time do we have now, Joe? We have just about 10 minutes left. 10 minutes, okay. Mm -hmm. um, as I've said to you, Jerusalem is the primary focus of Mark's gospel, the primary focus. In fact, six of the 16 chapters of his gospel are t taking place in Jerusalem. Um, and so that plays a major role in Mark's theology of who Jesus is and what he is all about. Now, it's interesting. Um, in Mark's Gospel, Jesus' message is not about himself and not about his identity as Messiah. Um, do you hear me? Mm. His message, according to Mark, is not about himself or his identity as Messiah. Mm. If you notice any reference in Mark's Gospel to Jesus as Messiah, do not come from human beings, but from the Spirit. And I'll give you three examples. At his baptism, there is the voice from heaven that says, this is my beloved son, listen to him. Interesting, no one else hears it but Jesus. Mm. 
And then there's the occasion of the um, transfiguration. I'm sorry, of the time when one of the most provocative events is the one that happens between Jesus and the high priest. Now, this is very fascinating, according to these two scholars. It is the high priest who says to him, are you the Messiah? And Jesus, according to the, the gospel account, says, you say that I am. Or another gospel will say, I am. But what I haven't found out is that in the Greek translation, and I know you studied Greek. I should take a look at right? it. <laughs> Ego, I mean, mm -hmm. can mean I am or am I. So anytime there's a reference to Jesus as, as the Messiah, it's usually the Spirit or the Holy Spirit that is generating that discussion. Back to their point about if this, if, if Mark's gospel, according to Mark's gospel, if Jesus' message is not about himself or his identity, what is his message? And according to these two scholars, his message is the kingdom, kingdom. of mm -hmm. God. Which only heightens the stakes for this, exactly this show. Exactly <laughs> right. E exactly right. <laughs> and you know, um, one of the things that's fascinating about this is that Jesus' understanding of the kingdom of God, it, that it is present and yet to come. And it's not a kingdom of war and politics and domination. So in summary, you know, since our time is mm -hmm. taken away from us, there are two processions coming into Jerusalem on this Palm Sunday. One represents the kingdom of God, and the other one represents the kingdom of domination the kingdom of Roman politics. And um, that's going to set up the clash that Jesus will face in front of Herod and in front of Pontius Pilate. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm going to read you the last paragraph of this chapter, and maybe this will heighten what, what, we're trying, what I'm trying yeah. to say here. Um, these two scholars end their chapter by saying the following. This conflict that we're going to see in the last week of Christ's life is not about, if you will, Judaism against Roman imperial power. This conflict is also not about priests and sacrifice as if Jesus' primary passion was a protest against the role of priestly mediators or against animal sacrifices. Rather, his protest was against a domination system legitimated in the name of God, a domination system radically different from what the already present and coming kingdom of God, the dream of God, would be like. Two processions entered Jerusalem that day. The same question, the same alternative, faces those who would be faithful to Jesus today. I wonder which procession we would be in. Mm. The, procession, the procession of peasants, of serving, or the procession of domination and conquering. Mm. So that's it for tonight. Yeah, that's a great question to ask ourselves, especially during the season of Lent as we're preparing to celebrate the events of Holy Week, to ask ourselves, where would we find ourselves? Do we find ourselves more you know, in adulation and adoration of some kind of great political figure that we think is going to, or not necessarily political, but just worldly figure who we think is going to solve all our woes, or is it in Christ. Exactly. Especially right. the difficulty that brings, because as we know, his kingdom is, that's the image of his kingdom, really, exactly. as, as we'll probably see later in the book, is the cross rather than, you know, that's exactly him on a throne right. or something like that. You know. Now, um, has your opinion, has your, do you see Jesus in a different light, a little bit of a different light as a, as a regard this opening chapter of this book, the last week of Jesus? Yeah, I think uh, in the sense that, you know, especially in the sense of what he's doing as he's coming into mm -hmm. Jerusalem, that this is not just, you know, um, you know, that there are so many other overtones to what's going on here, you know, right. and for everybody involved, not just for, for the people in the crowds, but also for the disciples, for the apostles, and then by extension for us too, you know, exactly. what's happening as we, as we're going to celebrate Palm Sunday in a little bit of a different way this year, how are we, you know, as we're approaching that procession and participating in it, 
liturgically. Right. Even for us, it's there's certain overtones about what we're what we're doing by doing that. You know. Brilliant. We're proclaiming him that's as our that's king. the key point here mm. i'm remi- but one thing that came to my mind as i read this chapter is this was not just the sad jesus walking into jerusalem but this was already planned and he knew exactly what mm. he was doing the courage of jesus to face the procession of domination that's true yeah especially at a time like you're saying when Jerusalem is packed with with people. I mean, it's it's you know it's right. certainly not an, an easy time to enter into the exactly city. Exactly right. Yeah, especially because he doesn't have you know he doesn't have any kind of retinue with him. He has just a, a donkey. That's basically. right. That is and, exactly and, the, right. and a couple of uh, you know. That's exactly right. <laughs> fishermen. <laughs> yeah. That's exactly right. But what courage it must have taken yeah. him, because he knew about that procession. Yeah. Well, yeah. we'll see you next week. Yeah. And we'll take a look at uh, Holy Thursday. Yeah, that'll be great. Yeah, Thanks it'll be a lot, nice. Joe. It'll be nice to delve in more, too. So, right. yeah, we thank everybody for joining us uh, this evening for the first installment of this lecture series. So, as I mentioned at the beginning, we'll be having um, this series each Wednesday. So, continuing again next week on Wednesday from 7 p.m. to 7.30 p.m. And also, uh, in the future, what we'd like to do is, uh, as you're watching and tuning in live, we'd like to allow you the opportunity to ask questions and to comment um, if you're watching live, obviously, if you're watching afterward and not live, you can do that too. But if you are watching live, we'd like to give you the opportunity to ask questions, to enter into the discussion, um, and we'll try to, as best we can, work those into the discussion. So stay tuned in the future. Um, and if you want to pick up, um, you know, a copy of the book or, or find it somewhere to read it, so you can read along um, with these passages, especially I think as we're in this season of Lent, to prepare ourselves. In just a couple weeks, right, we're at the, the halfway point in Lent now, so we're just a couple weeks away from celebrating um, the events of Holy Week and from entering into Palm Sunday, entering into Jerusalem, entering into the events of Holy Thursday and Good Friday and the Triduum. And so how much more can we prepare ourselves by, by sort of reflecting now on these events and reflecting on how we are going to enter into Jerusalem with Jesus and ultimately to experience not only his death but also his resurrection. So. Um, this can be also hopefully a great, uh, great sort of catalyst and motivator to prayer, to our own prayer and reflection during these days in anticipation on the events of Holy Week, the events of Good Friday and Easter at Ultimately Resurrection. So thank you again to everybody for um, joining us, and we really do hope to see you uh, virtually again next week and on the Wednesdays in the future. So thank you. Thank you. Good night.